Perfect. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so again, you know, first of all, thank you all for, for joining and I would like to take this opportunity to also thank my dear colleague, Dr. Butter, for, um, you know, allowing us the opportunity to, to teach and, and educate. Um, you know me by now, right? Um, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a background because I feel it's important for you guys to know who I am. Um, I am a graduate of King Saud University, which will always be very dear in, in my heart. I also did a four-year residency in the King Fahad National Guard Hospital. And then I also did, repeated the residency here again in the United States. And then I did a maternal fetal medicine fellowship at the University of Mississippi. So that's kind of my road there. I have a very, very, very big passion for teaching. Um, over the years, I have helped many, many students pass many exams, right? Whether it's board exams, USMLE exams, whatever exams there are, I enjoy teaching them, tackling them and all. Now, when you look at maternal physiology, it is a very interesting topic because what I have noticed a lot of people doing is memorizing it, right? Um, which is not what I want to do here. I want to make sure that you guys understand the core concepts. Again, like usual, the lecture is consistent with the most recent, recent guidelines from American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. And um, a lot of the stuff that I used in this um, lecture is actually referenced from um, Creasy and Resnick, which is a very well respected um, book in the OBGYN world. Now, there are some things in the physiology that are a little bit controversial. So what I try to do is bring you the most things, you know, things that are most, um, you know, consistent and that you've got more uh, people agreeing on it. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Okay. Again, my goal is to always, always fun learning that memorize, that minimizes memorization. That is my goal. Now there's a lot of animations today and some of them may, may look like they're, you know, basic, but trust me, if you actually follow those animations, it is going to be fun. It's going to stick in your head and you will never forget. Now, if any of you happen to be studying for any exam, this lecture is going to be very valuable. If any of you are doing residency, this lecture is going to be valuable. If you're an attending that wants to refresh um, what they know, this lecture is going to be valuable. And what I have also done is I've noticed that I've had some, some fellow attendees from various programs. So I've also included some slides that I think the fellows will find very enjoyable. Okay. Sounds good. Now, like I said, are you all ready for us to start? Everybody's awake, everybody has stretched up. And those of you that can drink coffee, are you, do you have mug in hand and are you drinking? Yep. Everybody's ready? All right, perfect. Are you guys excited that we're gonna be talking about physiology today? So here you go. I'm gonna start out by giving you these golden rules. And if you understand these golden rules, things are going to be much, much easier moving forward. So remember, in, when, a, when a lady gets pregnant, what happens? You get more blood flow to the organs, right? Now keep a mental note. Who is responsible for more blood flow to organs? It is going to be the heart, right? Now, don't we also need more oxygen? Absolutely. Which organ is going to be responsible for giving us more oxygen? It is going to be the lungs. Now, as the uterus grows, don't you think it's going to push on adjacent organs? Whether it's the bladder, the kidney, the stomach, the diaphragm, right? And then what else is gonna happen? Progesterone is going to cause relaxation of a lot of muscles in the body. Right? So these golden rules are going to be very important moving forward. All right, let's move on. So before somebody's pregnant, the uterus is what? 70 grams. When they do become pregnant, at the end of pregnancy, the uterus is about 1,100 grams. That is a big growth. That is a big growth. Now remember, this is because of hypertrophy, not hyperplasia. Okay? That means the cells grow bigger. We don't have more cells. Primarily, this is the effect of estrogen, all right? And the uterus no longer becomes a pelvic organ once we hit 12 weeks. 
These are some signs that occasionally make it on multiple choice questions, and I always want you to look at it. Chadwick is bluish discoloration of the cervix and the vagina, and it is because of the increased regional pelvic blood flow. Now, the other three signs that we're going to be talking about all have something in common, and that is softening. It's just where does this softening occur? So Chadwick, bluish discoloration. Goodell is softening of the cervix. Leyden sign is softening of the midline of the uterus. Heger sign is softening of the junction between the cervix and the uterus. Um, now, I don't want to indulge my age, but I've been practicing for God knows how many years now. And other than the bluish discoloration, all right, I have not elicited the Leyden sign, the Heger sign and stuff. Isn't it frustrating when you see something always in books and you're like, well, what am I going to benefit from this? Right? That's how I feel. I don't know how many of you share, share um, the same view. And the other part of it is um, when, whenever you look at things like that, you're like, couldn't they find something better to ask me about, right? Is that, what, is that what is going to make me into a better physician? Anyhow, enough of that side note, okay? Then you get the cervical aversion of the columnar, columnar cervical glands, and then you get cervical mucus thickness. Now, here we go. This is what we're going to do today, right? We are going to talk about the uterus, which we already did. We are going to talk about the GI. We're going to talk about the renal. We're going to talk about the respiratory changes, the heart, right? The stomach, all of these things. And now that we have added her organs back, oh yeah, and the thyroid. And now that we have um, added the organs back, she's smiling and happy, okay? So that's kind of, remember what I said? We're going to first of all look at the forest and then move to the tree. Okay, look at the forest, move to the tree. All right, so cardiovascular changes. Let's talk this through, right? What did we just say? We said we need more blood flow to organs, which is rule number one. The heart is responsible for giving us more blood flow. So what is the heart going to do? Come on, I wanna see, act, I wanna see you guys wake up. What is the heart going to do? It's going to give us increased Come on, it looks like some of you are not, not awake. It's gonna increase our cardiac output, right? And what is cardiac output? Right? It is heart rate versus stroke volume. Perfect. Now, here is where understanding is key. If I have the heart pumping more, there is going to be more blood flow through valves. You agree? more blood flow through valves. And what is that going to manifest, it, manifest itself as? A murmur, a physiological murmur. And in pregnancy, that physiological murmur is going to be a systolic murmur, right? Then, let's look, our friend, look, let, let's look at our friend, the uterus. What is it going to do? Is it going to elevate the diaphragm? Yeah. And then when it elevate, elevates the diaphragm, it's going to push the heart upwards, giving us a left axis deviation. See, it's not, all, it's not all memorization. Then, if the heart is squished, don't you expect to see an enlarged cardiac silhouette? Absolutely. Let's move on. What about the vessels? What happens to the vessels? We said progesterone relaxes, right? So what is going to happen to your vascular resistance? Right? And then if you have decreased vascular resistance, that means your blood pressure is going to drop, right? And then you're also going to get increased plasma and red sed volume. Isn't that cool? Now, it is believed and it is thought that the decrease in the vascular resistance is more than the plasma, more than the effect of the increase in the plasma volume on blood pressure, giving us a net reduction in blood pressure. Meaning any pregnant lady that is not known to be hypertensive prior, pregnant, prior to pregnancy should never have a blood pressure of more than 140 over 90 
because pregnancy facilitates a drop of blood pressure. And also, it may give you a false sense that a chronic hypertensive is now normalized. All right, wonderful stuff. So now that we have put this, we need to put numbers, right? So heart rate increases by about 20 to 10, 10 to 20, by 20% 20 or by, by about 10 beats, okay? Stroke volume increases. Cardiac output increases by 30 to 50%. Now, those of you that want a higher level of understanding, okay? If there are any people that kind of want to look at this, why is this important clinically? So if we have somebody who has an underlying cardiac disease, they are more at risk when? There are four times in the pregnancy that they are at very, very increased risk of getting complications, right? So let's say somebody has a aortic stenosis or anything of that nature. What are the four critical times? A, the minute she gets pregnant, right? Because the cardiac output and heart rate goes up at the beginning of pregnancy. Then it continues to go up. And that's why I put a lot of stars here. It peaks at 32 weeks. Meaning, if somebody makes it to 32 weeks of pregnancy and beyond, it is most likely that whatever cardiac legion they've had is not going to cause any effect while she is still pregnant. Okay, because the maximum is reached at 32 weeks. Now, the other two, other two big tests for a patient are intrapartum and immediately postpartum, right? So now you see understanding this physiology is going to help, right? Now let's do some housekeeping stuff. So there is increase in the ventricular wall muscle mass and end diastolic volume, more distension. Cardiac compliance increases, but it's very, very, very important. Even though the compliance, meaning how much the, 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 the heart can fill, right, you know, increases, it does not compromise ejection fraction. The other part of it, and this is what most people believe, is once you've gone up on your stroke volume, there really isn't a lot of leeway. So towards the end of pregnancy, if the mom needs to compensate, her mechanism of compensation is through increasing the heart rate. Okay, perfect. Now, we talked about peripheral vascular resistance. It decreases because of progesterone relaxation. Now, other hormones that are thought to play a role include prostaglandin, endothelial derived relaxant factors, example, nitric oxide, right? And there's a lot of people that feel because your vascular resistance has decreased, the body is compensating and the body compensates by increasing the heart rate, stroke volume and cardiac output. Cool stuff, right? See now how we're, we're making this, this heart thing much easier, okay? And it's simple rules, right? More, more blood flow to organs, more oxygen demand, progesterone relaxes, gravid uterus pushes, right? I want you to, these things, I want them to be Pavlovian to you by the end of this lecture. As soon as you hear the word physiology, the things that I want to come to your mind are more blood flow, more oxygen demand, gravid uterus pushes, progesterone relaxes. These need to be ingrained, okay? Now, arterial blood pressure, we said decreases in the first and second trimester, but it almost returns to normal levels in the third trimester. And it's usually at its lowest in the mid-second trimester. And it's thought that, that the blood pressure does not go up because of the incomplete compensation from the decrease in the peripheral vascular resistance, even though the cardiac output, okay, went up. And you know why I'm, I'm, I'm pointing this out? Because there's a lot of people that ask me this question. Well, if we have more volume, why does the blood pressure, does not, why does the flesh, why does the blood pressure not go up? The reason for that is your vascular resistance decreases. Okay, anybody has any questions at this point in time? Anybody has any questions? All right, we talked about the systolic murmur. We talked about the left axis deviation. Now, here is another thing that is important. And this is why you don't let the, 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 pay, the, the pregnant ladies, you don't them, let them lie in the supine position. Because what is the gravid uterus going to do? It is going to compress the vena cava. And if it compresses the vena cava, it's going to decrease the return to the heart in, term, 
it is going to cause hypertension, drop in blood pressure, syncope, bradycardia. And if the mom is not able to um, you know, pump very well, what do you think is going to happen to the baby? It is going to have, right? Fetal heart trace abnormalities, which is why what do you do when this happens? You try and alleviate the problem by putting the patient in the right lateral position so that you can dislodge the uterus from pushing the vena cava. For those of you that want a complete list of cardiac changes, I have included them. These are the complete heart changes, cardiovascular changes that can happen. Here's the problem though, okay? Here's the problem. Can you get dyspnea that is pathological and normal? The answer is yes. You know, if I had a penny for every pregnant lady that came in and she said shortness of breath and she was normal, be a rich man, right? Can you get syncope? Can you get all of the chest, chest pain? All of these things, they can happen. But the, the, the stuff that is on this side are more likely to be pathological. So in any exam setting, if you see a diastolic murmur, you're going to pick pathological. Now here's another thing that a lot of you do not know and can make a mistake in, especially those of you that are taking exams. It is okay to have a small pericardial effusion. The other trick that a lot of the examiners play is they know how the brain or the human brain thinks. So you know that there is axis deviation. And instead of, and instead of saying left axis deviation, guess what the evil people do? They write right-sided axis deviation. But because you're so inbred, right? You're so inbred into it. Okay, what happens? You pick it and you, you get it wrong, right? Okay. Anyhow, let's move on. Okay. This is a little bit more advanced than what a lot of you would like to know, but I definitely think anybody that is doing a fellowship is at the end of their training, or even somebody that wants to know in more in depth, is when you put a Swan-Gans catheter, you can measure all of these, right? And in general, think of it that way, right? If you have more heart rate, more cardiac output, right? What is, do you think is gonna happen to the resistance? It's gonna try and go down to adjust these changes, correct? You agree? So look here. What happens to your cardiac output? It goes up. What happened to your heart rate? It goes up. What happens to your central venous resistance? It goes, sorry, since, sorry, your systemic vascular resistance. What happens to it? It goes down. What happens to your central venous pressure? Does not change. What happens to your Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pressure does not change. See, this is a interesting slide, okay? Perfect. Now, intrapartum cardiovascular changes. We said, as the patient is laboring, what happens to your cardiac output? It goes up. So when you're around 30, three centimeters dilated, it goes up to about 17, it goes up by 17%. Seven centimeters dilated, it goes up by 23%. And then when you are more than eight centimeter, it goes up by 34%. Meaning each contraction squeezes around 300 to 500 mLs of blood out of the uterus into circulation. That's a lot. And also look at this, your oxygen consumption goes up by threefold. These are some, some really big, big, big changes, right? Some big changes, which is why if you had a heart that already was susceptible, this is the time when things can become really dicey and problematic. Hey, come on. I don't feel that you guys are awake. Prove to me that you guys are awake. Come on, right? We need you all to be awake and, and, and up here, okay? We're all there? All right, I'm telling you, by the end of this lecture, things are going to be much easier. You'll, you'll trust me on this, okay? I know a lot of you don't like the lung volumes. Guess what we're going to do? Make them easy, okay? Now, postpartum, immediately, what happens? 
remember there's a lot of blood flow, about 750 ml of blood flow to the uterus per minute. Now suddenly the baby's out. This blood flow has to go somewhere. Where does it go? It's as if you're giving this patient a ton of transfusion back. It is going to shift back into the circulation and cardiac output immediately after birth can go up by 80%. That's a lot, that's a lot of change. Okay, now, what did we say that happens to plasma volume? It goes up by 50%. Red cell volume goes up by 20%. So then why do we get an anemia? If I have an increase in red cell blood volume, why do I get an anemia or a physiological anemia? Absolutely, it's a dilutional effect. So if I start out and give each one of you $100 or 100 reals, right, you're equal. If I give one of you another $100, they're now at $200, and then I give the other person $1. They both went up, but the percentage, or when you compare them, it now becomes instead of one to one, two to one. The same thing applies here. If your plasma volume goes up by 50%, right, your red blood cell volume goes up by 20%, guess what? Then you're going to get a dilutional anemia. Now keep that in mind. This physiological pregnancy of dilutional anemia is actually what is believed to be protective against getting more clots. So that way it decreases the viscosity. All right, cool stuff. Now, here is something that you guys will always see on any exam that you take, any exam, it doesn't matter what it is, right? And it's never gonna go away. So what is the mom trying to do? It's trying to make sure that the baby continuously gets oxygen. So the affinity to, to, to mature, the maternal affinity of oxygen should not be high, it should be low. So what does the body do? It increases erythrocyte 2.3 2, 2 slash 3 diphosphoglyceride concentration, which shifts the oxygen association curve to the right meaning it is easier to release the oxygen, it decreases the affinity of the oxygen, and what does that in turn do? Sends more blood to the baby, right? Perfect. This is something that I want you guys to make sure that you know, right? Oxygen, the, uh, the oxygen curve shifts to the right, decreasing affinity, two erythrocyte, erythrocyte 2,3-diphosphoglycerate goes now, let's talk about the gastrointestinal changes. Are you guys ready? What did we say? The uterus, intestines, and the stomach, right? What did we say? Progesterone relaxes, and the gravid uterus pushes. Now, if the progesterone has relaxed the muscles, what do you think it's going to do to the lower esophageal sphincter? What is it going to do to the lower esophageal sphincter? It is going to relax it. What do you think it's going to do, the, the gravid uterus is going to do to the stomach? Sphincter that is not well closed and something that is pushing up, you are going to get GERD. Now, studies have shown that gastric emptying does not change. However, the transit time in the intestine is longer. So do you think these mothers are more prone, more prone to getting um, what you call it, constipation? Absolutely, okay, absolutely. Now, the other thing that, that I also want you to remember is when the uterus pushes on the intestines, do you think that that could potentially move where the appendix is? And the answer is 100%. So be wary. If you have somebody that comes in with nausea, vomiting, and signs and symptoms that are very, very similar to appendicitis, but the, instead of the typical lower, lower quadrant pain of the appendicitis, it's pushed, up, it's pushed up a little bit, that still can be appendicitis because everything gets pushed up and displaced. Now, before we move out of the, the GI tract, right, what is the hormone, right, that causes hyperemesis, gravidarum, and nausea and vomiting? 
beta HCG. And we will talk about that later on as we move forward. Okay, perfect. So GI, motility is decreased, probably secondary to the circulating progesterone can result in constipation, relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, gastric emptying time is unchanged, and the stomach is displaced upwards, taking with it the appendix, right? Now, we're gonna talk about the respiratory changes. Speaking of nausea and vomiting, right? How many of you get nausea and vomiting by just looking at this table? Nobody? You all like it? <laughs> it is a table that is historically not, not well liked by people. All right, do you, wanna, do you wanna make it easy? And you will never struggle with this again? All right, so let's talk about rule number one. We said we needed more oxygen supply. We are 100% aware that that's going to be done through the lung, correct? So how is the lung going to achieve that? One of two ways, right? It's either going to increase the number of times you breathe in and out or the amount of breathing you do. Is there any other way? No, I either breathe more or breathe more times, more in, more times. I'm gonna tell you right now, respiratory rate in pregnancy is unchanged. So that leaves us with only one way of increasing oxygen. And that is through increasing, right? The tidal volume. And the tidal volume is just a fancy way of saying we are taking deeper breaths, right? Now, when we put, a, when we put the vital capacity, the vital capacity is the maximum amount of air you can inspire in after you forcefully expire. So that's the maximum amount of air you can inspire into your lungs. If I now tell you this is unchanged, this is unchanged. Now, let's move forward. Expiratory reserve, inspiratory reserve and tidal volume equals vital capacity. This is unchanged, this has gone bigger so again, if I have a limited space and I stretch out, I'm going to take from the space beside me. So what do you think is gonna to happen to your inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve volume? They are going to go down, right? If I now tell you that the residual volume also goes down, because if you think that the uterus was not gonna show up, it is. Your total lung capacity and your residual volume goes down. If I now tell you that the functional residual capacity is these two volumes together and they both went down. So what is going to happen to your functional residual capacity? It is also going to go down. Now let's take a little bit of a, a look here. Okay. Two things are unchanged. Respiratory rate, vital capacity. One thing went up which is tidal volume. Everything else went down. Now, these are volumes. That's different than FEV1, F whatever it is. Those are not volumes. These are specifically talking about volumes. Now, I also don't want you to say, hey, Jamil, get taught us wrong. What happens to minute ventilation? What happens to minute ventilation? Minute ventilation goes up. Because what is minute ventilation? It's respiratory rate plus tidal volume. Tidal volume went up, respiratory rate did not change. So what is going to happen? You are going to get more minute ventilation. Now, I'm taking a deeper breath. What am I doing? I'm taking a deeper breath. What am I doing to my CO2? What am I doing to my CO2? I am washing it out. And when I'm washing it out, less CO2, what's gonna to happen to the pH? It is going to go up and give us a respiratory alkalosis, which is physiological. physiological. What does that mean? That means in any pregnant lady, if you find somebody that is 
acidotic or at the higher level of being alkalotic, guess what? That's not normal. Okay, so tidal volume goes up by 30 to 40%. Total lung capacity decreases by 5%. Minute ventilation increases. Minute respiratory volume ex increases. Expiratory reserve goes down. Non-pathological respiratory alkalosis. All right, vital capacity unchanged, respiratory rate unchanged, and residual volume decreased. Did you guys think that, that this would be this easy? Did you think it would be this easy? Right? So now, now, oh, somebody thought it was. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Well, see, I'm going to say the people that said yes, thinking it was going to be this easy, it is because you had a lot of faith and confidence that we were going to present it in a way to make it easy, right? <laughs> All right, sounds good. Perfect. Okay. I know my, my idea is always to have fun. So now oxygen consumption goes up by about 50, 50, you know, 15 to 20%. And 50% of that oxygen consumption is required by the uterus. Perfect. Let's talk about renal changes. You guessed it now, right? What are we going to do? We're going to say more blood flow going to organs, right? So if I have more blood flow going to the lung, to the kidney, what do you think is going to happen to my glomerular filtration rate? It's going to go up. More blood flow, right? I need to work quicker. What do you think is going to happen to my creatinine clearance? It is going to go up, meaning my serum creatinine is going to go down, right? Because if I'm clearing things much quicker, right, then they're going to decrease in the serum, right? Now, we said more blood flow. What do you think is going to happen to the kidney? Watch, watch here. Size of the kidney is going to go up, right? What do you think is going to happen to, we said progesterone relaxes. What do you think is going to happen to the ureter? It is going to relax. And of course, our friend, the gravid uterus, and mind you, what did I do here? It is tilted. Why? Because the issues are more prominent on the right side. So you're more likely to get right-sided hydronephrosis. You're more likely to get impingement on the ureter on the right side of how the uterus actually goes up. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So now, if I have the ureter relaxed, right? What do you think is going to happen to the transit time through the ureters and the bladder? It is going to go down. Now, if you have stasis, doesn't that increase your chances of having a urinary tract infection? It goes higher. If I also have urinary tract infection and stasis, what do you think is going to happen to the chances of having hydronephrosis? It is going to go up. What do you think is going to happen to our chances of getting kidney stones? They are going to go up. Now the uterus is pushing on the bladder. What do you think is going to happen to urinary frequency? And there is general relaxation, something is pushing. Don't you also think that there's going to be an increased risk of incontinence and increased urinary frequency? All right. Now, those of you that, that, that um, found this difficult before, are you able to see the pattern? We're making things much easier now, right? Perfect. So kidney size increases by about one centimeter. Glomerular filtration rate increases by 25% in the second week and by 50% in the third trimester. Sorry, in the second trimester, okay? Renal blood flow increases, reaching its peak by about, um, you know, uh, but when it reaches its peak, it's about 50% more than, than prior to pregnancy. These renal changes, we said progesterone, relaxin, and nitric oxide cause, of, cause all of these, right? Now, if somebody asks you, and this is a common question, why do we get more problems on the right side? A lot of you are going to look for dextral rotation of the uterus, which is the obvious one. But if you don't find it, then look for other things, right? It's also the way that the right ovarian, location of the right ovarian vein and how that crosses down the uterus, okay? Now, 
The one that a lot of you don't know is there is a protective cushion effect of the sigmoid on the left side. It cushions, it's a pillow. So when that uterus tries to impinge, there's the sigmoid. Okay, sounds good? All right. Lena Nigra. Now remember, in pregnancy, it's either progesterone or estrogen, except here, okay? <laughs> this is because of the melanocyte stimulating hormone, the black line, the Lena Nigra, right? Due to the melanocyte stimulating hormones. Mask of pregnancy, again, is due to the melanocyte stimulating hormones. Spider angioma, right? Spy, sorry, spider angioma and palmar erythema, right? What happens? They're because of the circulating estrogens. All right, endocrine. So let's talk together, right? And here's what I want you to, guide, to, to think about, right? In pregnancy, is it essential for the baby to get glucose? It is absolutely essential for the baby to get glucose. So do you think that the pancreas is not going to undergo some changes to facilitate that? You bet you, right? More importantly, okay, there's a hormone in the placenta that increases. So to think of it that way, right? In a way, the diabetes of pregnancy is actually protective because what does it do? It raises the maternal blood sugar, ensuring that the mom continues to give sugar to the baby. What is the hormone that causes the human placenta? Well, I, I said it. What is the hormone that goes up that increases the insulin resistance causing the mom to have diabetes? Human placental lactogen, okay? So again, more blood flow to the pancreas. By logic, it is going to undergo hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now think of it that way. Fetal glucose is 20 milligrams less than the mother's glucose. So it has to go through, and this is another exam favorite, how things cross the placenta. It goes by facilitated diffusion. Insulin and glucagon do not cross the placenta, which is why the most preferred way of controlling maternal hyperglycemia is insulin. Ketones freely cross the placenta, and amino acids are actively transported. Perfect. Let's talk about the thyroid. Listen to me for a minute here, okay? And let's, let's understand this, right? What are the major players in the thyroid balance in pregnancy? What are the major players? Okay, wonderful. So your first one is beta HCG, why? because beta HCG is very similar to the thyroid hormone. So it makes logic. Can it affect the hormone, the thyroid hormone function? Absolutely. Then your estrogen causes you to have more binding capacity. So that binding capacity is going to decrease initially the free T3 and T4, right? It's gonna bind it, it's gonna to sponge to it. What's gonna to happen to your pituitary hypothalamus axis? Got less T3, less T4? So you are going to try and produce more thyroid hormone, correct? So the end result is your, the end result is your free T3 and T4 is unaltered. However, your total T3 and T4 has gone up because you have more thyroid hormone bound to it, right? Look at that makes it easy. Those of you that like numbers, right? For every 10,000 units of an increase in your HCG, it lowers your TSH level by 0.1. Hence, it makes a lot of sense that in the first trimester, your TSH can go down. Again, which is why people with molar pregnancy, twin pregnancies, and anything that causes your HCG to go up are more prone to having nausea and vomiting, but at the same time, they are more prone to having thyroid abnormalities to the point where people that actually have a molar pregnancy could potentially, could potentially get a thyroid storm. Excellent. 
And then when somebody has a thyroid storm in a molar pregnancy, this is one of the few exceptions where you don't pick a DNC as your first line of treatment. Because if you take somebody that is in thyroid storm to the OR, they will die. So you still have to control their thyroid storm first, and then the, do, do the DNC once you have controlled their thyroid storm. Excellent. So estrogen stimulates an increase in the total binding globulin. Total T3 and T4 are increased, and then active T3 and T4 remain unchanged, which is why it is critical that the moms are not iodine deficient, okay? Especially with the renal clearance, it favors more the iodine secretion. There you go. These are some just random facts. Like I said, any of you that have taken any exams anywhere, 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 you will get these questions. How much does the placenta weigh? About 400 grams. How long is the umbilical cord? 50 centimeters. Now, here's where they trick you a lot of times. Uterine blood flow is 750 mLs. Of that, 400 to, 400, 400 to 500 is placental blood flow. And then when it eventually gets to the umbilical cord, it's about 350 to 400 mLs per minute. Hence, right, why having things like vasa previa that bleed can be very detrimental and can cause the baby to die. And the amniotic fluid volume at term is about 800 mLs. Now, for those of you that want a full reference, this is a wonderful, wonderful site, a really wonderful site. For those of you that are sitting there and going, what is normal in pregnancy? What is abnormal in pregnancy? What is the normal parameters? And the, the, you can go to perinatology.com, which is a beautiful website. And in perinatology.com, if you actually go to lab references, it has all these labs listed, and then you can pick the lab of your choice. For instance, if you wanna see the serum sodium and how it changes in pregnancy and what the normal references are, it will list it for you, okay? So that way you can know normal from abnormal. Perfect. Now, we're gonna shift gears. And if you thought that we got rid of that uterus, you are absolutely wrong. That uterus is still coming back, right? Your favorite organ, right? Your OBGYNs, man, you've got to love the uterus, right? Now, this is going to be a gift for you guys. So let's make this uterus pregnant and make this uterus pregnant early on. So this pregnancy, what hormone does it produce? What hormone does it produce? It produces the beta HCG. Another exam favorite is where is this beta HCG produced? It is produced from the syncytial trophoblasts. Okay, now this beta HCG keeps the corpus luteum alive. What does the corpus luteum produce? progesterone, right? And the progesterone in turn keeps the pregnancy alive. See that? So let's say somebody was doing surgery for an, appendi for an appendicitis at around seven, seven to eight weeks of pregnancy and they, oops, ruptured the cyst that's in the ovary. What did they do? They inadvertently ruptured the corpus luteum. So now what has happened to your progesterone production? It's gone down. So what do you need to do? Supplement these patients with progesterone. Now see how this makes sense? It's a cycle, it's a circuit. Once you disrupt any of the circuit, okay? Again, if you have syncytiotrophoblasts that are not, not producing enough beta HCG, your corpus luteum is gonna fail. If your corpus luteum fails, then you're not going to be able to maintain the pregnancy. Hence the idea of people supplementing with progesterone throughout the pregnancy. Okay, perfect. 
beta HCG, we talked about it. Let's do some housekeeping. It has two, two units, the alpha and the beta. And we said the beta unit, is, beta unit is always unique. And the alpha unit is similar to LH, FSH, and TSH. Maintains the corpus luteum and is produced by the syncytiotrophoblasts. It can be detected as early, as early, okay, as eight to 10 days. This is not weeks. As eight to 10 days after fertilization and it peaks at 10 to 12 weeks, which is about 100,000. So what do you think is gonna to happen to hyperemesis gravidarum if I just told you that it peaks at around 12 weeks? It's a first trimester problem, then no longer goes up, right? So people in the first trimester have the beta HCG levels that are high. Now it's also important for us to see if the pregnancy is healthy to help us decide whether there is a nictopic pregnancy by looking at the doubling times. And be cautious though, the doubling times can change in multiple pregnancies. Human placental lactogen, it is a single chain polypeptide and it is very similar to the growth hormone, right? And HP, HPL levels increase as the placenta grows, reaching its peak at 36 weeks. Why am I mentioning this? Because when do we traditionally do the, the glucola screening test? When do we traditionally do the glucola screening test? 24 to 28 weeks. Meaning, if this hormone peaks at around 36 weeks, there is a big potential that you may miss diabetics, right? You know how many times I've actually seen a patient after they had a normal one hour glucola screen and the baby's huge and there's polyhydramnios, and then we have them panel their blood sugars and they're high numerous times, a lot of times. Okay, a lot of times. Isn't that, isn't that fun? Okay. I don't see the energy. Where is the energy? Or are you guys absorbing all of this in? I don't feel the vibes and the energies today. Or are you guys absorbing all of this wonderful information? Well, the good news is we are almost done. That's the good news, all right? And the better news is I think you guys are very, very good now in, in um, physiology, right? <laughs> in a fun way. It is very challenging to make, make physiology fun. It is really challenging, you agree? How many, of you, how many of you thought when you come in and take a lecture about physiology that you would not sleep? I thought I would sleep, right? <laughs> all right, sounds good, <laughs> okay. Now, we talked about progesterone, it maintains the pre pre pregnancy. It is produced by the corpus luteum until the 10th week, and it is. Now, here's the deal. Once we get out of the first trimester, who is now the sole organ that is responsible for progesterone? It is going to be the placenta. Then, here it is. Your MFM boy here is gonna help you in gynecology. All right, click at that. If the corpus luteum, if no pregnancy happens, what does that mean? You don't have HCG. If you don't have HCG, what is going to happen to the corpus luteum? It is going to disintegrate. It's going to undergo apoptosis, which usually happens nine days after ovulation, meaning the menstrual cycle happens and about 14 days after ovulation because the progesterone is no longer able to maintain your endometrium, okay? So here's where MFM boy is gonna help you in gynecology. A, corpus luteum is your only source of progesterone, only source. So if you have somebody who is deficient in progesterone, then you know 100% that they did not ovulate. All right, so that's where your progesterone challenge test comes in. If you do a progesterone challenge test and you don't have bleeding, then you know your problem is not just a lack of progesterone. But if you give somebody progesterone, withdraw it, and then they have bleeding and amenorrhea, then you know their problem was a lack of progesterone. You know that their estrogen is good. That means the ovary is functioning. You know the pituitary is functioning, and you know that your hypothalamus is functioning. That means you have an unovulatory condition such as menopause, right? Or a young girl. There you go. You got an extra brownie point there. 
Now, believe it or not, those of you that, that uh, I actually still enjoy teaching gynecology. I still do, right? <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right. The, so we talked about the disruption of the corpus luteum prior to, to seven weeks of pregnancy will result in first trimester lo loss. It relaxes the smooth muscle through the mother's body and levels above 20 suggest a good pregnancy, less than five suggest an abnormal pregnancy. Additional calories, the mom needs um, additional, an additional 300 um, kilocalories per day in pregnancy and about 500 kilocalories when she's lactating, which means that people that lactate and breastfeed are more likely to lose weight, okay? Iron requirements, you need one gram of iron in, uh, sorry, in pregnancy because 200 milligrams is excreted, 300 is transferred to the, plus to the fetus, and your original daily requirements of iron were 500 milligrams. With that, we end. All right, our lecture. And I really urge you to follow, you know, Medical Education Without Borders on Twitter. I also urge you to follow me on Twitter because that way I get to know you more and answer all of your questions. Anybody has any questions? Clotting factors will be covered when we, when we talk about some other topics. It's a, big, it's a big topic that I intentionally left. And here's what I'm going to tell you. When we talk about clotting factors, so I actually ended up um, I wrote one of the, so I actually wrote a chapter about stroke in the critical care book, right? And one of the things that I had to do was talk about the clotting cascade. There is so much controversy. There is so little consensus. It will take much more than the time allocated. So again, if you guys want, I was going to cover it briefly when we talk about um, bleeding and pregnancy, but if you guys want a specific talk about the clotting cascade, we can definitely arrange that moving forward. Okay, Jamil, very much. Thank you very much. It, yani, I oh, yeah, before, I'm sorry, before those of you, um, I, unfortunately, somebody hacked my, my um, what you call it? WhatsApp. My WhatsApp account, and they have been sending uh, messages on my account, you know, behalf saying that join a group for, um, you know, COVID fighting or jo join whatever it is. My account has been hacked. If you get anything from me from WhatsApp, please ignore it. And if any of you are experts in, in retaining and help, accounts, help then, them. Then, please find me. then help me out here. Okay, Jamil, uh, I did not know how this hour went so fast. There was a question by uh, Salman Tariq, why Shadwick is bluish despite more blood flow? So it, it's actually thought to be, there is blood flow, so that means more blood vessels, and the blood vessels are hypertrophied. So it's the color. Remember how when you when you look at somebody who's, who's got a lot of muscle building, you see their vessels look blue. So it's not the color of the blood. It's more of the blood vessels or more. That's the thought. And uh, there was another question by uh, uh, Dr. Shadia. What about the vaccination during pregnancy? Can you shed a light on that, please? Yes, we can definitely shed a light on that. Um, so the general vaccinations that we give in pregnancy and we recommend are Tdap and influenza when it's influenza seasons. The other ones are given to patients that are actually high risk for getting those. So for instance, somebody who's going to go to an area that's hep A, endemic, they can get the vaccination. Somebody, and if you guys, see, this is what I want. That's why it's important for you guys to communicate with me. Once I know what you guys are deficient in, so for instance, I got a lot of, a lot of um, people wanting me to cover infections in pregnancy, and we're going to do that. We also got a that. lot of... Yeah, we're going to do a lot of, um, we're going to cover a lot of other things that you, so keep telling us what you want, and we will do a special um, lecture on it. And I think what, what I can do is, in one of the lectures, I can actually tell you vaccination. So the way that you look at it, you have to say safe in pregnancy, unsafe in pregnancy, recommended usually, and then you recommend it under certain circumstances. So we'll do that. There was another question uh, that... Um... We, can you just uh, uh, repeat again uh, the, po the last point you mentioned in regards to progesterone and uh, the, the slide that you had where you had, you talked about the gyne, the gyne side, remember that? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, okay. 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 So, so again, let me, let me put it this way, okay? For you, let's say, you have, you have the pregnancy that happens. You've got your HCG and then your HCG, what does it do? it causes your corpus luteum to stay alive. If there is no pregnancy, no pregnancy at all, that corpus luteum 
feeds from the HCG. And after nine days, it no longer has any feeding source. And unless you give it HCG, it is going to disintegrate. Once it disintegrates, your progesterone levels are going to start to drop. <coughs> progesterone is essential in maintaining the endometrium. So once the levels drop to a certain amount, the endometrium is not going to be, you know, not going to be sustained and you're going to shed it and there's going to be bleeding. Now, everything has a source. Progesterone comes from one thing, and that is a corpus luteum. Corpus luteum comes from only one thing, and that is ovulation. Meaning, if there was no ovulation, there was no progesterone, if there's no, so there's no corpus luteum, if there's no corpus luteum, there's no progesterone. Perfect? So now, for you to be able to have menses, you have to have a pituitary, a hypothalamus, right, and ovaries that are functioning to give you the corpus luteum. So now when you do a progesterone challenge test, it's like going through a puzzle. You give things back and you see what causes the patient to have menstruation. So if I give a progesterone challenge test and she does have menstruation, that tells me immediately that we have a pituitary that is functioning, a hypothalamus that is functioning, an ovary that is producing estrogen, and only lacking in progesterone. Put the two together. I have, a, I have a cycle that is lacking progesterone, and I just told you that the only source of progesterone is ovulation. So this is a person that is not ovulating, correct? Hence, you give somebody progesterone and they do not have bleeding, then the problem is, just, is not just on ovulation. Then what you need to do is say, hmm, is she lacking estrogen? Is she lacking hypothalamus pituitary axis stuff? And that's why then you give progesterone estrogen and so forth. Okay. And we can actually cover that. I don't mind. I enjoy covering that, that topic. What other questions? Are there? I see, I see a very interesting three questions. I'm going to tell you the first one. Yeah. Now, and I think this is a very nice clinically oriented question. Like if a patient comes with tachycardia mm -hmm. during uh, labor, uh, what kind of, does, does patient require immediate workup? cardiac enzymes, what okay. should you do about it? So that is a very, very good question. And the, hey, I'm going to cover it, but also this is a, a, a question that I'm going to cover when I give you guys the yeah. lecture about sepsis. Because you never very look good. at just tachycardia by itself. You look at, is there an explanation for the tachycardia, right? So example, if you have somebody who has a pulse of 120 and at the same time is febrile, hypotensive, you're now thinking about, hey, this is probably sepsis, right? If you have somebody who, you know, came in with a normal pulse and is now in the second stage of labor and pushing and her pulse went from 90 to 130, different. But in general, if you have somebody who has a prolonged, you know, and it's not just 110, 100. So for instance, what we do is if we have somebody with unexplained tachycardia above 120, with no febrile, with no explanation, we start out with an EKG and so forth. Now, as far as cardiac enzymes, we don't do them unless the patient is symptomatic, but we do an EKG and we also do a thyroid function to make sure that that's not the explanation for her tachycardia. But you can definitely, you have to weigh it. You know, somebody with tachycardia at one centimeter, somebody at tachycardia at 10 centimeters is different. Does she have fever? Does she have other symptoms? Does she, does she have syncope? And the other part of it also, th do you think that the rhythm is regular or irregular? If you have somebody with tachycardia and they've got skipped beats and stuff, it's more, more problematic. So I would say there isn't a rule that fits all. You just have to look at the clinical picture as a whole. I think this is going to be the last question. And wh whatever questions for after that is going e to be on the account. Yeah, don't on the to account email. of Twitter. So we can, so everyone benefits out of the questions and the answers. So the and last anyhow, question. And if, I, if I ever get a question that is interesting for whatever reason on my account, I always... I always retweet it to, to Medical Edge so that you guys don't miss the opportunity of-, of Yes, of, we don't want anyone to miss the opportunity for an information that might benefit anyone. So now the last question is going to be, now we see a lot of use of progesterone treatment, especially at the beginning of pregnancy. Once we're talking about early pregnancy, we see a lot of people receiving oral progesterone, hydroxyprogesterone, cyclogest. So, What's, what's the talk about that? How do we approach this? Uh, which one is better? Does, this, does anyone have a, a, an overhand uh, compared to the other? Should we do that? Should we not do that? And when should we prescribe progesterone? 
so so the, unfortunately the the it's called you know the luteal phase deficiency or anything like that there is no studies out there that actually support routinely giving progesterone to support the luteal phase the pregnancy is either good or not good and then as far as after that the only time where you actually need to give progesterone and here you go here's mfm boy moving out of his comfort zone is, that's what i wanted to hear <laughs> <laughs> look at that is when you actually have a, an ivf cycle where you've actually you know you've inhibited the ovulation and then you you give them the the ivf they don't have any source of progesterone because there was no corpus luteum there you go you can't make you, mfm is there but there's no no good data so if there's no good data on something then it really doesn't matter whether you give it vaginally or oral now there are some other people that follow a different approach and they actually measure the actual progesterone level and if it is in the in, in, in intermediate zone or they feel it's low, then they will give those patients supplemental uh, um, progesterone. But like I said, the American College stance right now on this is it does not recommend routine progesterone supplementation, even in people with recurrent miscarriages, only in IVF. All right. Well, well like I said, I'm always available. Much. Yep, I'm Never. always available on email, on Twitter, wherever you guys want. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Just not for Thank you very much, Jamil. It's, no it, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I didn't know how that hour went so fast. And uh, please post any further question uh, on the Twitter account. And please join the WhatsApp groups. And please share those WhatsApp groups with everyone. We want uh, the maximum benefit for everyone. Thank you very much, Jamil. Thank you very much, everyone. And good night. All right, take care.